you know, the, the great, this is just a great opportunity to get, to get you guys, you know, the core workshoppers who have been teaching this stuff forever um, together along with our current fellows and to have this dialogue, right. About what it's like being on both sides, um, teacher and student in both for the first time, you know, coming into uh, touch with this material and, and, you know, gradually mastering it, et cetera. So it can be more of a conversation. I think some teams kind of planned it as such more of like kind of a full Q and a others did kind of a bit of a presentation up front with maybe one, you know, one or two questions from the fellows and either way that's going to be fine. So no problem. Any other questions before we jump in here? Welcome everybody. This is great. Hello, Brett. Great turnout. Mike, good to see you. Okay. Hey, good question. Oh, please, I... please, Sasha. Yeah. Just, uh, you said that Harini is not uh, joining us today. So are we discussing the SES just? So great question. <laughs> since she's, <laughs> since she's not able um, to join Hilda, I'm not sure if you've been in touch with Harini at all. Um, no since okay okay yeah um we'll probably just have to skip over that for the time being unfortunately mm -hmm. um but luckily since arini is joining us for the next well no not the next colloque i think she's in two weeks for the last one of term uh she may be able to speak a little bit to it then and and uh, maybe do we'll, we can have some of the discussion we planned for today though certainly there's a, a huge number of people on the line right now who can speak about um, ses and if you'd like to just off the cuff offer a few thoughts here and there you know please feel free when we get to that point Thank you. Great, yeah, another great question. Okay. Well, without further ado, how about we go ahead and we go ahead and jump in? Okay. No, this is great. Um, well, hey, again, welcome, welcome everyone to, to our very special teaching the workshop, uh, history and methods roundtable. Thanks so much for joining us. Zoom fatigue is very real, especially in mid-April. So we're so appreciative of all of you taking the time. Um, this event is really the culmination of a year of work that our wonderful Ostrom fellows, uh, Jamie, Renzo, Hilda, Jordan, Daniel, Daphna, and Sasha have done with a tremendous amount of support. Uh, for many of our senior workshoppers, including Adela, uh, Bill, Mike, Dan, Edu, Brett, um, and Harini, among others, frankly. And of course, our wonderful staff. And I wanted to give Emily um, Castle a call out since she's really taken the lead in building out our new teaching resources page. So thank you, Emily, for that. Um, as you'll see, it's still a work in progress, but we're making lots of fast progress, which is exciting to see. Um, our marching orders to this group were both simple and frankly kind of complex um, to help to update the workshops online teaching resources to both better inform students and interested teachers while also helping to inspire and equip the next generation um, of workshoppers. As we look ahead to the 50th anniversary of the workshops founding, which is coming up so quickly in 2023, um, our hope is that this new site will be a focal point, a gathering place for all those who've been inspired by the workshops unique history um, and groundbreaking methods. It's still a work in progress, as I said, which many of us, um, including, I'm happy to say, Harini, who will be speaking more about this in a couple of weeks, will be helping to build out going forward. So we'll put up the link here momentarily. You can check it out. Um, you'll see what's up there now. But as I said, it's just a foundation that we'll continue to build upon to compile um, and where needed, create new teaching resources, including in multiple languages to make them as, as accessible as possible. Um, in addition to covering the leading methodolog methodological tools and governance frameworks associated with the workshop, uh, there's going to be reading lists, sample syllabi, some short webinars, some of which have already been uploaded. Um, thank you, Brett and others for doing that. We also want to give uh, credence to the challenges that students experience when they are first presented with this really tough material, uh, with tips from those who have been teaching this, as you're going to hear about today, to make it as impactful and real. And kids, some of us can attest, you know, as life changing as possible. Um, our roundtable today is designed to feature just some of these highlights from this ongoing effort with teams represented by our longtime affiliates and current fellows having this conversation that we spoke about a minute ago um, about this key subject matter, what it's like to teach, what it's like to learn it, and how we can support one another in this journey. Um, so I'm going to put the agenda in the chat box. I think all of you saw it already, but just to make sure it's an easy reference here. And there we are, there we are. And I'll keep track of the chat as we go per usual. So what we're gonna do is turn to Adela and Bill um, in just a moment 
And then, uh, of course, Renzo with questions. Um, we'll also quickly pause, you know, at, le at least briefly between each of these topics. So if folks have kind of a quick thought or interjection they'd like to offer. Um, we're beginning with IAD, as you'll see, then we'll move on to Polycentricity, Bloomington School, um, and go from there. Okay. Um, so without further ado, first off, Adela, Bill, thank you so much for doing this and would welcome your thoughts and reflections on teaching the IAD framework. All right. Well, Adela won the coin toss and decided that I should go first. Uh, so I, <laughs> so she gets the second half. Um, I have probably taught the IAD more recently than some of you, but I have probably taught it less often than many others. Um, but I have had the opportunity to teach it at sort of two extremes. One is to PhD students in the workshop. So that's kind of one group. And the other is to undergraduate students taking an intro level political theory class, like introduction of political theory. And I didn't get my hands on that class until just the last five years of my career. So I've only gotten to do that recently. Um, and let me tell you that calls for different approaches uh, because um, PhD students at the workshop are actually the easier group um, because they're a captive audience to begin with. Um, and secondly, they are, of course, this year was different because we weren't physically together, but they are sort of immersed in this place and sort of figuratively, if not literally, sort of looking around them. And so you can say to them, okay, well, one of the things that this place is known for is the institutional analysis and development framework. So let's get into it. And you can build an entire semester around that. You can talk about sort of precursors, things that fed, you know, ideas and previous work that fed into the development of the IAD, then the elaboration of the IAD, and then you can get into extensions and applications of the IAD. And so, you know, in, in a way, that's the more luxurious opportunity to teach the IAD. Adela has taught it at the graduate level too, so I'm going to truncate my discussion of that, besides a bunch of people on this uh, call have, have been on the uh, receiving end of, of, of my teaching it for the workshop. Um, when you're teaching this to undergraduate students in an intro to political theory class, instead of it being sort of a natural thing for them to learn, it is instead this um, this weird imposition that gets you know dropped on them in, in during a course that is also supposed to cover a lot of other things. Uh, they have no natural inclination to be curious about it whatsoever. Um, and you're just sort of hitting them with it um, with uh, about the same amount of, of joy and welcome as a cold Gatorade bath uh, at the end of uh, at the end of the game. Uh, so what do you do? It, for me, it, um, I have tried to introduce it for undergrads as with a, with a focus on the action situation as the core. So there's not time to get into a lot of the rest of the framework, but the action situation as the core. We have taken the 1986 Public Choice Society presidential address in which Eleanor um, introduced the IAD to the Public Choice Society, or at least the action situation. And, um, and it's an article called the, An Agenda for the Study of Institutions. And it comes in the middle of a segment of the course on institutions. And then we take that particular article in tiny chunks, like five pages at a time spread over three class meetings to just kind of walk through this. And there are, is a lot, I find that what seems to be helpful for students at that level is a lot of analogizing. Um, so, you know, thinking about an action situation, thinking about have, do you belong to any student organizations? How do people get into the, how do people join that organization? What positions are there in that organization? How do people get into those positions? Who can do what? You know, are there agendas circulated before? Who does that? Uh, whose responsibility is that? Uh, and, 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 you know, and how does the group decide on things? 
And then, you know, going on to other analogies, here's a, you know, here we are in a classroom, there are two positions, student, professor, how do you get into those positions? How do you get out of those positions? How do you get out of this crazy outfit? Um, and, uh, and then, you know, and then jumping to something that's more perhaps directly political, like, you know, here's the United States Supreme Court, there are two positions, Chief Justice, Associate Justice, how do people get into those positions? How do people get out of those positions? Who has to do what? How do, how does the group reach decisions? What's, what's allowed? What's not allowed? Can, you know, scope rules, can the Supreme Court declare war? No, uh, you know, I mean, you, you, a lot of it is just introducing the elements of an action situation by analogizing to other things that they might be more familiar with so as to try to share with them that this is a framework that you can use to structure the way you think about any one of a wide variety of situations that you might either be in personally or be studying at one remove um, uh, someday. Now, Adela is going to tell you how you actually teach the IED framework. Um, so your turn. <laughs> well, uh, thanks, Bill. That was a great introduction. Um, so uh, different from Bill, I mostly teach the IAD framework in the context of a master's level environmental policy class. Um, and so I'm able to work with the students across an entire semester in um, learning the framework and using it and becoming comfortable with it. I also teach it in a PhD seminar, but it's, we spend, you know, maybe two sessions on it. So I'm not going to, and I just throw them into the deep end um, with all the core readings on that. So I'm mostly just going to focus on this master's level uh, class. The way that I frame the IAD framework is not up front, I don't frame it as the IAD framework. I uh, um, frame it as uh, teaching a set of policy tools that have universal applicability that can be used to uh, both diagnose problems, a variety of different environmental problems, and also used to prescribe solutions to those problems. And so uh, I tell them that by the end of this, they will be a policy analyst and they will have a set of policy tools that will allow them to analyze virtually any situation. And that seems to uh, get their buy-in that they can walk away with a set of tools. Um, and then we work through each of the major boxes in the IAD framework without them being introduced to the IAD framework up front. And so we talk about different types of environmental settings, different types of ecosystem services. And, um, and I use a lot of case studies and we do a lot of comparisons across different settings. And then we talk about the actors and people's norms and how they make sense of the world. We talk about knowledge and information and whose knowledge should count in decision-making and what's the difference between science and um, uh, local knowledge about um, situations. And, and then, you know, we spend time looking at rules and property rights and, and policies. And once we work through all of the big boxes with lots of case studies and examples, then I bring it together for them and they see the IAD framework as a whole. And then we spend the rest of the semester looking, applying different institutional arrangements to uh, different environmental settings. So why do markets work well in, in one setting, but maybe not another setting? And, how can we use the framework to analyze why performance varies? And so we work our way through, you know, from collaborations uh, to markets to regulatory uh, systems. And, um, and it seems to, it seems to be well-received. So I'll start. Thank you so much, both Adela and Bill. Um, and, and Renzo, did you have a, a quick question for either or both? I have a 
a brief comment and a question. Oh, please, please, okay? please both, yes. Well, thank you, Bill and Adela. It's, it's really insightful uh, as a student and future teacher, hopefully, uh, to listen to your, to your approach to teaching the ID framework. Uh, so I really, really grateful for sharing that. Um, as a student, as a PhD student mainly, coming from a background in political science and public administration, and also my professional experience in rural areas in Latin America, and also as an immigrant in the US, uh, I did struggle a little bit uh, with the IED framework and reading, understanding institutional diversity. Uh, and Bill has heard this from me in class a lot. <laughs> um, but uh, the, the thing is that given the reality of the unequal power distribution and its implication on outcomes in the countries I study, mostly in the global South, I was actually puzzled by the fact that um, the role of these power imbalances among actors were left aside from the analysis as a whole, uh, especially of action arenas and action situations. Um, and when you study political science, and do research on it. Um, in particular, you, you look at the structural, institutional, behavioral conditions of actors, which are uh, very important, um, particularly how actors interact in the face of power struggles. Uh, but the IED framework, as it's discussed in the book uh, from the out outside, it identifies uh, its purpose, that its purpose is uh, to develop a universal language that is systematic, standardized, and uh, and it also aims to identify the elements uh, that build the framework itself to guide policy research and policymakers on, on analyzing how rules uh, affect interactions between actors and also the outcomes in diverse institutional settings. Um, so it, it helps organize the thinking and map actors across different types of uh, issue areas. Uh, so why, that's why I think the IED framework is not uh, part of, per se, political science, but it's important for many different disciplines, uh, economics, environmental studies, political science, and it frames the analysis of different social issues uh, to understand different uh, diversity of outcomes. Um, so what I believe is that uh, its core challenges, to sum, sum up what I was saying, uh, it's core challenge to have on how to incorporate as a primary element in the framework the role of the unequal distribution of power and resources. Um, so uh, related to that, uh, my question uh, for Bill and Adela would be, and, and Bill knows that where I'm going already, uh, but how would you teach to students the role of power and uh, unequal distribution of power in particular in the context of the IED framework? I'll hop in quickly here because I know we're running out of time, but I think uh, what uh, Dan and now Tom have put into the chat uh, hits it spot on um, that power isn't on the surface. And uh, the word power uh, from my distant recollection of graduate school and being trained into this is that it's not a common term that's used, but it permeates the IAD framework. And I think you don't have to go any further than Vincent's work on constitutional orders. And his concern was about uh, rulers versus ruled. And that's all about power relationships and, and the emphasis on how do we develop governing arrangement in which citizens our sovereign is all about power. So I know that that's an unsatisfactory answer for you, but I think that uh, it's um, a, that the IAD framework um, in, handles power and can be used to examine the types of power differences that you're pointing to, Renzo. I, I agree as Renzo has heard me talk about also, but um, just to amplify for a, a very brief moment, um, even if I just, if, even if I did nothing else with the IAB framework, but just looked at the seven types of rules, those seven types of rules in the IAB framework are a way of identifying and locating how and in what ways power inequalities manifest and how power inequalities 
have their effects. So if I think about boundary rules, just to start at the top and I'll be brief, you know, can people freely get into this situation? Can they freely get out? Or are they forced in? Are they kept in? Or is exit not an option? I mean, that's a great manifestation of a power dynamic. Uh, you know, is that you take information rules? Is is any are are some people allowed to keep things secret? Are other people required to disclose things? Is it discretionary? Is it uh, is it mandatory? Um, that's a that's you know another element of power. Who makes group? How are decisions for the group made? Does it really only matter what one person thinks or what one group thinks, or is there some sort of real aggregation of? Uh, multiple uh, viewpoints into uh, into a group decision. So I, I would think about the rule typology as a way of constructing or deconstructing the anatomy of unequal power dynamics in a situation uh, by just sort of systematically going one by one through these things and saying, well, who can do what and how and who can't do what and how and why and you know, can any of that be changed? And if so, how? And you know, that kind of stuff. Um, so I'll stop there because we've got a lot else to talk about. No, thanks so much. Thanks so much, Bill and Adela and, and Renzo. There's so much great, uh, great stuff in the chat box here. We will save this and send it out to anybody who's interested. I noticed maybe just one last question from Aaron that we could turn to before we move on to polycentricity. Um, and then of course we can return to this, you know, time permitting for discussion at the end. But Aaron was asking about struggling a little bit, I think to make um, IAD, but also SCS, which we can turn to and others uh, relevant for practitioners who see themselves as occupying one or two positions for their careers and less des interested in designing optimal institutions um, than navigating the ones we, we that, that we all kind of live within. So uh, it sounds like Adela, you were speaking about making this, you know, really relevant for policy um, implications in particular, really driving that point home. Maybe you could speak to how how, how you've tried to overcome, you know, that perceived, um, you know, a divide between, you know, theory and, and practice here. Yeah, um, with the, the students that, the master students that I teach, um, they're in a professional master's program. And so they're going to go out and practice this stuff, which is, uh, why I really orient the IAD framework around a set of policy analysis tools um, and that we work through uh, dozens of applied examples and um, that they're also invited to bring their own experiences into the classroom. And we use uh, those as um, uh, settings to apply the framework to. Once, um, I think most students understand that in, in any kind of environmental setting, you're going to be working with, with people, with the, the biophysical setting, and then with figuring out how to coordinate and the types of rules. And once they get comfortable um, with that kind of complexity in the analysis, then, then they really seem to take off with it. But I think the biggest challenge is having people um, com be comfortable with the complexity of it. Excellent. No, thank you. Thank you so much again, Adela, Bill, Renzo. Fantastic. And as a reminder, there's going to be additional content, including you know, a short webinar. Um, for uh, the IAD and so many great comments with regards to evaluation criteria. I'm seeing that Edu and otherwise. So hopefully we'll, we'll return to many of these threads as we go through here. But just in the interest of time, we'll keep rolling and we'll turn to Mike and uh, Daphne next because Mike, you can do polycentricity in five minutes, right? <laughs> uh, I've been trying to figure out how to do that. Uh, uh, I've been trying to make the transition, uh, Scott, between um, uh, sort of doing this in person and doing it in video and writing up a script for um, summarizing, uh, giving it a brief, you know, snappy, quick introduction to polycentric governance. Uh, the best I've done so far is 17 minutes. 
uh, and I keep adding more parts to it. So uh, I'm still okay. working on it. Uh, I think in five minutes, I can tell you what the term itself means, you know, the polycentric part and the governance part, and then just sort of leave it at that. Uh, there's a lot involved in governance, and so there's a lot of pieces and a lot of things, you know, end of story. Uh, uh, but I, it's, it's impossible to really snap down in, in a quick way. So the best I've come up with is to try to do that real quickly uh, and, and to really strike home I think at Vincent's, I think one of his most powerful comments in his classes and his interactions with students and presenters, uh, you know, anyone who uses the term government or state would immediately have Vincent, you know, sort of introduce. What do you mean by the government? What do you mean by the state? There is no such thing. Uh, tell me what part of the government you're dealing with or, or, or what this sort of, and he would have, Vincent would have the same reaction to power. What do you mean by power? What kind of power? Where is it, where is it entering in? Is it determining, anyway. Uh, and give them a little piece of Vincent that way. Uh, and, um, and then sort of go through quickly sort of how polycentric governance showed up in, uh, in the different pieces of, of the research programs, clearly in the constitution uh, um, that uh, Vincent talked a lot about the Federalists and how power sort of was involved in, in, in that, uh, how it comes up in their metropolitan governance work in Ostrom, Tebow and Warren, how it comes up in Lynn's uh, uh, late work on, on climate policy and, in, and into the police studies, uh, and also how it shows up in governing the commons. Uh, it's kind of hidden in there, but I think it's really a fundamental part of, of what Lynn was doing too. Uh, and then that what, that's what takes up 17 minutes. Uh, uh, so I'm gonna sort of leave it at that and, and let Daphna come in. We, she just interviewed me a couple of days ago uh, I don't know how long that interview went, uh, but it uh, was definitely more than five minutes uh, and see what kind of uh, general observation she had from trying to uh, dig this concept out of me in a, in a short period of time. So Daphne, what do, what do you have to say at this point? Yeah, first of all, um, I would say that that um, webinar that we recorded, it was like 21 minutes of your pleasure of discussing the polycentric governance. Yeah, and um, you know that this idea of polycentric governance of polycentricity, it was a game changer for me because I found it incredibly useful for my own research. But yeah, it's being a central concept for both Eleanor and Vincent Ostrom. It's a very complicated idea. So I find that basically my knowledge of this concept has these synecdical qualities. And basically the more I learn about it, the more I find out how little I actually know about it. And so like there is still like more for me like to dig into. And um, if I remember correctly, also during the last uh, Polycentricity Working Group meeting, uh, people were discussing some of the popular misconceptions of, poly um, of how this concept is uh, used and applied. So I thought that um, I would ask you about the misconceptions about the concept of polycentricity. So, uh, because I thought that by raising the issue of how the idea has been misunderstood by discussing basically what it is not, uh, we can open a productive avenue of discussion about what it actually is. So I guess like my question for today is, um, what are the most frequent misconceptions about polycentric governance? And how do you usually go about um, correcting those misconceptions? Well, the first one that would that would come to mind uh, is that it's all about automatic emergence of order, and, and it's all sort of the Pollyani sort of automatic emergence. You just let people do things, and, and you get the results. Sort of the invisible hand kind of argument that Adam Smith uh, made in a different in a different context of, of competitive markets. Uh, uh, for me, there's a hell of a lot of planning going on in in any polycentric governance system. Uh, and both Lynn and Vincent talked a lot about public entrepreneurs. And, and so they are putting together pieces of um, resources available to them to, uh, to um, uh, succeed in some sort of collective action. I think maybe if they had emphasized the role of public entrepreneurs more, the role of power would come a little bit better because it's sort of the way, it's sort of the equivalent of community organizers or movement leaders uh, in, a, in an effort in collective action. They're putting together the sources of resources where you can get funding, where you can get moral support, where you can get access to policymakers and things like that. And it's very much a creative act of putting together the pieces that you have uh, available to them. 
Uh, but um, uh, the, that, that sort of level of active power, active organizing and actively putting together the pieces and, and working on problems can kind of get missed if you just think that it just sort of emerges automatically. And so that's always been my pet peeve uh, about this in, in that there needs to be uh, some um, um, more appreciation given to the notion of planning even at the lower, the lower levels. Uh, but then at the at the higher level, I, I've in in the uh, piece that that uh, we had in uh, we had the um, um, colloquium presentation beginning of the semester, uh, this semester last semester I forget which one now, but um, where I talked about some of the problems that that, that uh, come up in some polycentric systems of governance and coordination is always a big problem. Uh, coordination at the at the system wide level, and you know coordination. Is a, is a collective good uh, for the system as a whole. And if the system of polycentric governance isn't providing that, then it's not really successful. It's not providing all the public goods at all the, all the scales that, that are necessary. And so that's, that's something also that I think needs to be addressed more directly. It's covered better in the literature on collaborative governance and, and cross-sector governance kinds of things. And I think we need to draw on that a little bit more. And in this thinking about how I would do this sort of in the video style, you know, I would have separate little videos on different things like that on how collaborative governance works or, or this question of emergence versus stewardship at the, uh, at the system wide level. Uh, and so those would be the major kind of misconceptions I would put out and that might be a good sort of topic uh, uh, for smaller kinds of, kinds of approaches. But it's, but it's also very hard to just get what the conception is and what, and what it means, uh, and especially if you're trying to fit all of what Vincent put into that term uh, into, into a small piece, because he really poured a lot of intellectual energy into, into what polycentric governance meant. So I think I'll stop talking and I'd see if someone else, uh, I bet Dan wants to come in at some point on this or something too. But uh, did you, or Daphne, did you have any other misconceptions you, you, you uh, you, you've noticed or, or that you first, you had to deal with uh, in, in learning this process, this concept? Yeah, I think that one of the main like misconceptions that I had to kind of like overcome is precisely to this idea that you have mentioned about the like spontaneous uh, emergence of order, basically like out of nowhere that like as soon as these different actors come, like the peace and harmony like emerges out of nowhere and basically these basically the amount of work that um like so to say that it is usually like put into um into the constitution of the order was kind of like often like bracketed so i found it like but also like very intellectually stimulating to kind of like dismantling these like own like preconception that i have that i have picked up as i was learning about polycentricity okay Wonderful. Thank you, Daphna. And thank you so much, Mike. Um, what, one of the goals we should clarify is not necessarily to distill any of these concepts down only to, you know, five minutes, but what we are trying to do is make them bite-sized so that, you know, teachers around the world would be able to, for example, just drop in Mike for five minutes on a slide and introduce, you know, some of this content. And over time, hopefully that'll evolve into a series um, of these kind of short offerings uh, just to make it hopefully more more useful than just, you know, a full, you know, couple hours on a, on a given topic. Though certainly all of these deserve uh, at least that, even just to do an adequate beginning. Um, I'm seeing a lot of good comments there in the uh, in the chat uh, box as well. And maybe one other thing I'll note, and perhaps Bill, you can speak to this, Will, uh, or Dan, of course, about the Polycentricity Working Group um, and the Polycentricity Database itself, the polycentricity.net um, that uh, that we've been helping uh, with, with IESC in particular, um, standing that up. So I, that, that could be another really good resource uh, for anybody interested in this, including for students. Is that fair to say, uh, Bill, Dan, Mike? Yeah, I think, I think that's a, a good idea. It, we're, we are trying to figure out the hardest part of any polycentric structure, which is coordination. Indeed. So we have our <laughs> colleagues in CASEL who have created the website and done a very nice job and organized a webinar series, which was really well done. And then we have the Polycentricity Working Group out of the Ostrom Workshop 
which has uh, really grown to a very nice uh, size of, of a number of subscribers and really uh, nicely attended um, working group meetings. And then we have the IASC, which is now hosting the polycentricity website that the Castle folks create and, um, and is including polycentricity in the conference series that they've organized. And so 2020 and 2021 have been a pair of years where there's just been a, a, a huge amount of stuff going on around polycentricity and polycentric governance. And truthfully, like any polycentric structure, it ain't always well coordinated. Uh, <laughs> some of the units do things that are brilliant uh, and, um, and very valuable, but it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, one of the other units was involved or on board or even necessarily aware. Uh, of what was going on. And so, you know, it's another, it's an object lesson in polycentric governance, which is one of the hardest things is communication and coordination when you have multiple overlapping centers uh, engaged in uh, common enterprise. Sure. No, thank, thanks, Bill. Yeah, any, any other thoughts or questions, suggestions for, for Mike? Um, or Daphna, or just on the general topic of polycentricity before we have to move on to that last point, Bill. And this this is still very um, you know amorphous given the ongoing uncertainty involving the pandemic. But we're we're hoping to do a, a joint hybrid conference at least with Castle, um, perhaps using you know the IU's Berlin Gateway um, next year. So we're talking May, perhaps May 2022 with gatherings in, in Berlin, again, you know, public health situation permitting, as well as uh, Bloomington and, and really help to drive home um, this research linkage as well as the teaching linkage. So I think there's a lot of potential there. And Mike, thank you so much again for taking the time um, and Daphna to have this conversation. It's been so helpful already. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, thank you guys. Okay, um, again, just in the interest of time to make sure we don't cut anybody too short here, we'll keep rolling, but of course we can return back to any of these areas. And Dan, I believe you are up next, uh, sir, with, with Jamie, uh, talking about the Bloomington School. Yeah, so um, first of all, I, I wanna congratulate Mike, uh, being able to introduce polycentrism or the polycentric approach to governance in 20 minutes is heroic. Uh, in my view, uh, probably the most difficult uh, of all the introductory videos, I would imagine. Um, not that mine was was simple. Uh, I sort of uh, have returned to sort of the uh, first principles in trying to describe the Bloomington School, its basic, its fundamental characteristics or features. Uh, and I decided I didn't want to stray too far or abstract too much from uh, Mitchell's initial uh, labeling of the Bloomington School uh, as against the two other main schools of, of public choice theory. So um, even though I've couched it mainly as a school of public choice, although public choice itself is a theory of positive political economy. So the difference between talking about the Bloomington School of Political Economy or the Bloomington School of Public Choice or even the Bloomington School of Institutional Analysis, uh, that's really just a matter of, of preference of, of labeling. Um, I'm, I distilled uh, 10 basic or fundamental, uh, what I call pillars of, of the Bloomington School uh, that I've managed to, I think, you know, distinguish from other pillars uh, in certain ways. Uh, the first pillar being one held in common with all schools of social choice or public choice being uh, methodological individualism, 
which is a normative commitment uh, of the Ostroms. Uh, and, uh, but I also distinguish uh, their version of methodological individualism or, or how they uh, describe the individual, the agent, uh, for purposes uh, of, of the workshop. Um, but then I also uh, try to reduce this often stark gap between methodological individualism and social constructivism by noting how important it was for the Ostroms that individuals are nurtured and exist within a rule-based system. So while they are uh, uh, explicitly uh, methodological individualists, uh, they, they are not anti-social constructivists. They think people are, of course, influenced uh, by the societies in, in which they, um, they grow up. So I, I talk about uh, that as well. Um, I talk about uh, the approach of the Bloomington School as compared to the uh, other schools of public choice, which tend to be, um, well, the Virginia School is highly deductive uh, based on um, formal models that are uh, basically almost completely insulated from the empirical world. Um, and the Rochester School, which is a, has a very uh, statistically oriented uh, approach to empirics, um, uh, or uh, what I guess we could say is more inductive. The, the Bloomington School approach I've always characterized as abductive, although uh, neither Lynn nor Vincent ever uh, used that term. Uh, but abductive basically means the starting point for analysis is a problem. Uh, a recognition of some problem under existing theories. Uh, and um, so the problem starts you off. You don't start off with a theory or an observation. Uh, you st the problem starts you off uh, and then you investigate it with, uh, with theoretical and empirical uh, tools. Uh, uh, one of Lynn's favorite phrases, embracing complexity, is another characteristic uh, that is almost unique uh, to the Bloomington School uh, among theories of political economy. Uh, also, it's, it's uh, devotion to uh, interdisciplinary multi-methods approaches to problem solving, uh, which to uh, all of us gathered here is now seems second nature, but uh, it's still surprisingly rare um, in places that think about uh, the, uh, uh, the political structure of the economic order or the uh, economics of political institutions and so forth. Um, because of the complexity, we need to think uh, more carefully about how we structure our analyses. We have to be able to, to some extent, decompose complex problems into uh, maybe easier to understand parts, not always, but sometimes. And so, and, and to facilitate this kind of interdisciplinary multi-methods approach, we need to have a common set of conceptual and relational tools. And so that brings up the grammar of institutions and it brings in the IAD and SES uh, frameworks, uh, which I treat as separate components. The grammar of institutions is one component and the analytical frameworks are another component uh, part. Uh, and then, um, I treat the design principles from governing the commons as it's become, I don't know exactly how to put it, it's, it's, it's become uh, uh, rooted in, in Bloomington School thinking 
in a way that you might not anticipate a, a single set of findings from a meta-analysis <laughs> uh, to be so fundamental. Uh, and yet, uh, we often use them in the Bloomington School for various purposes, including evaluation of, uh, of, of various uh, kinds of systems uh, and for prediction uh, as well. Uh, and then the, the final element that I, I describe, and of course all these are in the uh, script I've given you, uh, and this is more uh, evident in Vincent's work, although Lynn also uh, talked about it as well, just not as, he, she didn't, didn't hit as hard on it as Vincent always did, and that's the provisional nature of knowledge and theory. Uh, but Vincent had a very strong Popperian streak um, in his work. And uh, Mike and I were talking about this over emails last night, uh, actually, um, about how it, it almost seems sometimes as if um, the commitment, the workshop's commitment to polycentric governance is non-falsifiable. <laughs> It, it's 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 a it's a commitment so deep and and yet from its very uh, first birth in in sixty one I'm not including Polanyi's uh, initial use of the term but from the first time Vincent used it, it the the extent uh, of the desirability of greater or lesser uh, polycentricity he said is an empirical question. Right, and so the very idea, I mean, and it would, it would be odd indeed, right? What they were, what he was fighting against initially with the notion of polycentric governance was this uh, simple assumption of constant returns to scale in governance. That you keep having more and more economies of scale, the more and more you consolidate government services. It would be strange indeed if he but then posited a, a rival theory, polycentrism, where he thought there's there are constant returns to scale in of polycentricity. Uh, in fact, um, and Lynn actually wrote a great article with Christopher Anderson warning about the dangers of excessive decentralization. Uh, of of government services and so and Vincent and, and Lynn were both wrote wrote about failed states which tend to be among the most polycentric uh, states so um, so even that terms is subject to to the, you know updating revision and you know potentially although it's not likely to happen given how much uh, empirical work there is in support of it. Uh, at this point, but it, you know, it's even subject to falsification. Uh, and so um, and this is something that I don't, uh, until I was working on this, I, I never contemplated that as a sort of foundational feature of the workshop uh, approach, the Bloomington School approach. But I, <clears throat> I certainly a conducive to my own way of thinking around the world and that maybe I have a bias towards it, but I, I think it's definitely there and especially in Vincent's work. I, I've taken too long, sorry. Oh, to to no, thank you. Thank you so much, Dan. And and I, we're already getting, already getting requests for your script, <laughs> which we're disseminating. So thank you for okay. all the effort you put Great. into that. Um, Jamie, did you have a, 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 a comment generally about uh, the Bloomington School or question uh, for Dan? I'm sure, and I will work to keep it brief. Um, yeah, Dan, I've I've only seen like four pages of your script, and I really appreciate how in how deeply you've thought about this and taken us beyond Mitchell's definition. That's just really awesome. So everybody will enjoy seeing that. Um, and I really like agree with you. This idea of the problem is is what sort of the is the first thing that you start with in the workshop approach. Um, I know I I just gave a presentation here at the Association of Private Enterprise Education and saw lots of people who are fans of the workshop. Um, they want our T-shirts, just so we should go. Yeah. In, you know. <laughs> um, but no. Um, and, and and so I was arguing very similar point. And instead of a problem, I was starting with this idea of a conception, which is what Vincent and James Buchanan use. Start with but yeah, I totally agree with you on that. 
Um, and my question is, what do you find particularly challenging about trying to define what the Bloomington School is? Because there are just so many components. Yeah, well, I was surprised uh, by how many components I came up with in rethinking this um, issue. The, the hardest part for me was to try to find a, a logical structure to them. You know, not a not any kind of priority listing or anything like that, but more this grows out of that, right? This X is related to Y among the component parts of of the Bloomington School. You know, the the fact that a um, an interdisciplinary approach is what necessitates uh, well defined concepts, grammar of institutions, IAD and SES frameworks uh, uh, in the first instance, et cetera. Obviously, they become uh, important for other reasons uh, once they're developed. But um, that, you know, thinking about the initial impetus behind specific aspects was uh, um, was both important and then, you know, sort of thinking through how they relate one to another to uh, you know, if, if, you, if you're going to be calling something a school of thought, there has to be some kind of cohesiveness and coherence in, you know, the fundamental ideas. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I guess it doesn't have to be. And of course, lots of scholars are very skeptical of the idea of schools of thought uh, to begin with. Uh, I know Jeff Isaacs over in political science scoffs at the notion of, of schools uh, of thought. Uh, I'm not entirely sure uh, why, but uh, at least for me, it was important to understand why. What is this school of thought that we all think we're part of and what does it actually mean? <laughs> so, and uh, of course, my job was e easier than for Mike and many other people because a, a lot of the parts of the Bloomington School I introduced will get separate five or 10 minute videos made about about them. So I didn't have to elaborate everything the way uh, mm -hmm. others might. And that, that's a really good point, Dan. And we, we wanna have this open um, to as many interested folks as possible. So if you would like, for example, to step up and you know suggest some different content that you'd like to take the lead, lead on recording, including uh, related to the Bloomington School, any of these topics, just please reach out. We're happy to work with you. Um, and it would be wonderful to have as many different voices and backgrounds and interests represented yeah. as possible in the series. And I invite criticism of, of my list. Uh, please uh, help me improve it. <laughs> <laughs> Scott, Bill wanted to, to add something. Is that okay? Yeah. Well, actually, I was just going to ask, but I, I don't see him. Oh, yeah. I was going to ask Mike um, to respond to, uh, you know, Dan's comment about how do you find a way to structure this, which, you know, I, I certainly can understand where he's coming from on that. And I, you know, Mike and Jimmy tried to write, you know, uh, about the workshop and it's sort of basic principles and Mike organized that glossary of, of workshop terms that appeared in policy studies. Journal. And I just thought it would be interesting if, if following what Mike said about, or what Dan said about the challenge of figuring out like sort of even just an order of presentation of these ideas and how to link one thing to another, whether we could maybe rope Mike into, but I also know we, we only have limited time. So maybe save this for the Q and A later or whatever, but I'd love to hear Mike's thoughts about how do you organize something like that as well. Yeah, Mike, did you have a reaction to that? Or like you said, we can do chat as well. Oh, it might, you might've stepped away, Bill, looks like. So just, to, I, I know I just think we're kind of running a little bit behind, but that's okay because we do have time. And unfortunately, because of, you know, Harini having to step back, that did free up some more time for us. Um, Sali, though, you did have a quick, I think, question. Did you want to weigh in before we had to move yes. on? My question is, uh, do you think that uh, some methods are better fit for Bloomington School questions asked for Bloomington School of Thought than others? And I came to this question as I, as I was reading Mike's chapter uh, on Ostrom's tensions, mm -hmm. where he mentions that 
uh, Lynn Ostrom criticized some political scientists for including control variables for institutions and not finding any significance and arguing that institutions don't matter. So are certain methods in that sense, such as ethnography, you know, more prized, more valued in, in Bloomington school than uh, more uh, than other approaches? Thank you. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, it's, it's part, it's part of the reason why uh, Lynn and Vincent adopted an interdisciplinary multi-methods approach was their perception, the correct perception that in a world of complex problems, single methods from single disciplines are unlikely to provide comprehensive and accurate answers or, or diagnoses. Uh, and so they, and this is in strong contrast to either the Rochester or the Virginia schools of public choice, they want to bring in ethnographies and surveys and, you know, all kinds of qualitative, a prothic description, uh, grounded through, you know, all kinds of qualitative methodologies. Um, that uh, along with, right, they certainly weren't against quantitative methods. I mean, one of the reasons for the grammar of institutions and the IAD is to facilitate common coding of works done by anthropologists and geographers and, you know, so sociologists, legal scholars, whomever operating in the Bloomington School, so, so that we can code them commonly for purposes of small or, or large and quantitative uh, analyses. So, um, yeah, they, the, the Bloomington School is a kitchen sink school. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, you know, uh, you know, everyone has got to be pulling on the oars <laughs> with whatever tools they have in their hands to pull with. All about coordination. No, they, thank you so much, Dan. And thank you so much, Sally. Great question. Um, again, just in the interest of time, we'll, we'll keep rolling for now, but let, let's keep it going in the chat box. And hopefully at the end, we'll have a chance to reflect back on any of these, you know, topics that we have had to give short shrift to. But again, this is just an ongoing dialogue, right? This, this is clearly not the end of anything. Um, Sasha, I know that um, Harini obviously isn't able to join us, but you did prepare for today. So did you want to offer any quick reflections on what it's like from the student's perspective to first encounter and grapple with the SES framework? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I think the, my, the question that I prepared is really engaging with the discussion on the uh, IAD framework and fits really well for the IAD as well. And all this discussion on the, the methods and uh, the characteristics of the Bloomington School. So uh, something that I think uh, it's really valuable in the analytical framework, it's its ability to organize the complexity of the uh, social ecological systems. And uh, at the same time, Lin's approach to institutional analysis that is essential, essentially empirical, focused on problems, using an unlimited uh, variety of methods coming from different disciplines. So uh, driven by my struggles, trying to operationalize uh, the complexity of uh, the theory that I modeled, framed using the the SES and the IAD, uh, I would like to ask, uh, I think the question fits uh, several of you, but Adela and then uh, also touch at this, this topic. Uh, how do you approach in your classes the empirical research design to evaluate this series framed with the, the Ostrom framework? So how, how do you connect modeling, which uh, is, inherently an abstraction of the complexity and the, the this choices of methods and the research, uh, proper uh, research design for them. Great question, Sasha. Anybody want to jump on that, guys? I'm waiting for Adela to go first. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, nice easy one, Adele, well, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that really easy question. Uh, I would say that um, I think, uh, you know, besides governing the commons, probably one of the best, well, all of the books that Lynn did were really great, but is rules, games, and common pool resources in which uh, games, experiments, and case studies are laid out as appropriate methods for addressing um, social dilemmas and, and really for applying the IAD framework to analyzing data and understanding outcomes. So I would, I would turn to those methods. And the reason that they're so important and so powerful is that they allow the analyst to capture the full action situation or action situations and allow the analyst to engage in a more in-depth examination of interactions among actors and the outcomes that they realize and that this is possible at different levels of action. So I would, I would always start there with those types of methods to uh, address questions surrounding um, uh, or appropriate for the IAD framework. Excellent. Oh, I wonder if Mike has something to say before I say something. I was just ready to jump in there, Dan. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I think that's, uh, I think Adela's suggestion is a really good one because they, those are the, the pieces of that book are good examples of very different kinds of uh, research design. Uh, you know, there's nothing inherent in the IED framework that, that leads you towards any one particular research design. Uh, instead, what the researcher needs to do is to bring a research question to the, to the table. It's much the same way as, you know, using the IED or the SES to understand a policy problem. The researcher's got to bring a research problem, a research puzzle of some kind, and identify what's the relationship between the variables that you, you are most interested in, what's your independent dependent variables and things like that. And then you fit those pieces into the IED framework and see what kinds of things you need to gather data on. Uh, so you, you, can't, you can't expect to get the research question from the framework. You've got to bring the question to the framework, just like you got to bring the policy problem to the framework. And that's, that's always been, I think, the thing that, that um, has been kind of misunderstood about the framework. The framework doesn't really solve any of your problems for you. It, it, it gets you started and it, and it tells you what kinds of questions you need to ask, what factors you need to look at, and to make sure you don't overlook something really important and sort of forget about it. But it's not where all the answers are. Uh, but um, uh, in my experience, most of the answers are in Dan somewhere. So uh, <laughs> pass it back to Dan. <laughs> No, the only thing I have to add to what Adela and Mike have said is that a lot will depend on whether you're zooming in or zooming out with your research. Uh, are you studying a, a problem, you know, a discrete local common pool resource problem? Or are you writing something uh, theoretical about federalism? <laughs> you know, the, the context uh, is uh, going to, to some extent, determine what research methods are, are most applicable to, to your work. The one other thing I'll, I'll say is that, uh, and this was even before, at least in Vincent's mind, before they went to Bielefeld, uh, Game theory informs a lot of their ideas of, uh, of, of institutional analysis. It's, it's, this was, uh, you know, what I'm going to say will, may sound like apostasy, but it's, you could think of the IAD framework as a game theoretic model <laughs> in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and so I, I think there's a little bit of a, maybe a bias in that direction to doing that kind of 
mo using that kind of modeling, and it may or may not be a bad thing. Um, but as Adela mentioned, with rules, games, and common pool resources, uh, the other aspect of that book is the game theory, games, uh, that, uh, that Roy Gardner brought uh, as co-author uh, into that book. Uh, and so uh, it, it's all of a, of a piece. And, uh, but again, to stress what Mike said, it's, it's, it all starts with the, with the problem the researcher identifies and wants to get into. Yeah, that's a great point, Dan. No, thank you. And thanks so much for the great, great observations and suggestions, Adela and, and uh, Bill too. Let, let's move on though in the interest of time. So next up, we do have uh, Brett and Hilda discussing the governing knowledge commons um, framework. So Brett, any introductory thoughts on what it's like to teach this? Hmm. Uh, yeah, so hi everybody. Um, I know some of you, but I don't know many of you. So it's it's a real pleasure to, to just be on this with all of you. Um, yeah, it's interesting that, so preparing for this and preparing the, the um, quick, uh, video on teaching the GKC framework was a bit of a challenge in part because we don't teach it very yet very often. We're sort of the big thing for me over the last 20 years has been developing the GKC framework itself and, and trying to build a field or a subfield of interdisciplinary interdisciplinary scholars and, and, and students who are could who will use it. Uh, to do the kind of interdisciplinary work motivated by all of the, and inspired by all of the things that people have talked about uh, already with regard to the, the Bloomington School and the IED framework. So I won't go back through all of that. Um, I mean, I've taught the framework in my privacy law, economics and technology of privacy course, but in, over the course of uh, two classes and very briefly, and in comparison with other uh, frameworks like Helen Nissenbaum's contextual integrity framework, um, which resembles the GKC framework in some ways. Um, uh, Madeline Sanfilippo has taught it in her research methods course. And so she, if she were here, she could say more about how she teaches it to grad students. I teach in a law school. And so most of the teaching I've done with the GKC framework is teaching the GKC framework to other scholars, to other academics and, and professors who study knowledge sharing or intellectual property or knowledge curation and generation in one form or another, but have, but have looked at it through a rather narrow lens and I, and, but are, who are open to thinking about uh, the GKC framework as a broader uh, lens through which they can do systematic interdisciplinary work. Um, and so much of the last 20 years of me ever teaching it is really be teaching it at a conference or a workshop that I or someone else has organized, and I've brought together, you know, folks who are who I think are interested in using it um, in one form or another. Um, and so, you know, that uh, I won't go. I don't know. Some of the talks have been about actually introducing the framework, but I'm not, and I'm happy to do that if that people want me to talk about the GKZ framework and what it is. Um, but the gist of it, what's primarily difficult and different about it is it focuses on knowledge resources where knowledge is interpreted incredibly broadly as an umbrella term to all products of human intellect, whether it's data or inventions or creative works or basic ideas. Um, every, every natural resource commons that's ever been studied has always had a knowledge commons layer on top of it. Unfortunately, although, you know, not maybe understudied and maybe that's a, an area of research. I've talked about this with uh, uh, Angie and, and, a bunch, and Scott and a bunch of others before about possibly revisiting a whole series of natural resource commons and identifying the technology and knowledge commons layer uh, and examining it through the, the GKC framework as a way to maybe connect the GKC and the IAD together. Um, but, you know, I, I could go on and on, but I'm, I, it's almost maybe better if, I, if, if there's questions that people have about the GKC framework or some of the things that we do uh, or how it can be used, um, you know, if, they, if, if you wanna ask, I'm certainly happy to respond. I also would love to hear from people. So we wanna do a summer teaching workshop on the GKC framework and develop teaching mm -hmm. materials. So to some degree, I'm learning mostly by listening to what you all are saying and what you're putting together and how you teach it to grad students, because that's, frankly, what we want to be doing more of, and we probably aren't doing enough of. I'll, I guess I'll stop there. It's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brett. 
And like you said, so many opportunities to collaborate. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention, actually, it was perfect timing because just yesterday, Brett, I got the Governing Privacy and Knowledge Commons edited volume in the mail. So I'll put the link up there in the chat box. But congratulations. Thank uh, you. Yeah, another, another great um, uh, addition to the, to the series you guys are curating. Yeah, I, sh there. I should note that to everybody, I guess, is that like there's a website that you can look to. There's a, there's a mailing list. We have a book series with Cambridge uh, Cambridge Studies on Knowledge Commons, uh, where we're the series editors, and it's sort of an outlet to help do interdisciplinary research, because we know that a lot of junior scholars, it may not make disciplinary wise, it, you might not, it may be hard to get credit on a, on a tenure track, for example, um, for, and, and it's hard to find peer review journals as an outlet. And so publishing in a Cambridge University Press book in a respected series is something that we sort of built to enable it's actually a knowledge commons for knowledge commons it's to enable the knowledge commons we built the series so yes there's that book there's also the governing markets as knowledge commons book that's coming out uh if it's not out already like this month or next month too that's great so yeah. thanks scott no no thank you brett no, again it's, it's it's a great series i just mentioned that several ocean affiliates including mike mattioli um and myself I'll help write chapters in that one. So there uh, is a lot, let, maybe let's turn to Hilda next. Hilda, did you have a, you know kind of a, a reflection here about GKC or a, or a question um, for uh, for Brett? Sure. I think the biggest barrier that for me to learn not only the GKC framework but also like the IAD framework, SES framework, all other frameworks was to learn how to see things and also think like a sociologist because I came from a completely engineering background. I'm used to do coding, building website, but not used to work with the theories. And then that problem leads to the second barrier because I was not familiar with the sociology like concepts. The terminology and grammar they used in the framework kind of confused me when I just started to learn it. And then especially for people like me, I speak English as my second language. And then I also had a difficulty pro uh, identifying proper actors, rules, and had a problem understanding the interaction, interactions and identifying other con uh, like components. Those were what, quite complex for me at the beginning, but I think after reading others' work and reading how those people apply the framework to their studies was very helpful. Um, I do have a question not only for Professor Frischman, but Frischman, but also for like all other professors. What do you think is the most challenging part of teaching the frameworks to students from like technical backgrounds or from backgrounds with less exposure to sociology concepts? It's a great question. I, I think one of the hardest things in teaching the GKC framework is um, ex explaining why all of the details matter. It's a lot of a lot of times when you're coming from a different discipline, there's a, a narrow streamlined focus. Like this is the thing of interest. This is what I want to study. Why are you asking me all of these additional? Why am I why would I be asking all of these additional questions? And so, like one way I try to help get this idea across is say you're writing, you're, suppose you're, if you're doing a case study, the case study is in and of, in and of itself a knowledge product that's interesting. Like we want, we're gonna learn and know a lot about the the subject you're studying, but you're also it. So it's an output, but it's also an input into the 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 knowledge commons about knowledge commons, right? So in, in a decade or in 15 years, we were going to have hundreds of case studies that are systematically using this framework. You're con, you know the thing you're producing is you're asking some of those questions. You're digging into some of those other areas, not just because the, of the output you're going to produce. The case study itself is going to inform people about. X, Y, or Z about this research consortia or about this data pool uh, pooling uh, institution, but you're also contributing to the broader uh, uh, res uh, uh, research community that you're a part of. I think once people see that, I always feel like that's the, when, when people get that, all of a sudden there's like a light goes off and it's like, oh, that's why all of the context, all the nuances, all of the various things uh, matter why some of these questions that don't seem so interesting to me I certainly would have thought to ask them suddenly you know are worth asking I don't know, that at least for me that's one of the that's one of the things that I, I find important that was great no great 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 question Hilda and thank you Brett I would love to give everybody the chance to equally weigh in on that because I'm sure everyone would have really unique perspectives and helpful um, interjections but given that we only have 15 minutes I don't want to shortchange um, Edu and Jordan either um, but any any kind of final question um, from you, Hilda, or from anybody else on the GKC? 
Um, this is fantastic, Brett. And I'd love to talk more over the summer, as you said, as you guys are spinning up that uh, kind of teaching effort and we can hopefully, you know, join forces here and there. And that goes, of course, for anybody else too, uh, where it makes sense. So congratulations again, that's great. Um, and then last, but certainly not least, um, thanks for sticking with Edu and Jordan, um, sp speaking a little bit about common pool resources, the challenges of describing, you know, different types of goods, uh, challenging the tragedy of the commons, et cetera. Would welcome any thoughts, perhaps uh, turning to you first, Edu? Thank you. Actually, start with uh, Jordan, and oh, I'll upload a couple of slides here. Yeah, we're uh, we're going to change everything up uh, as the last people. Um, like so uh, we actually kind of uh, collaborated on our discussion um, and realized that one way to kind of um, approach this discussion was through the, the kind of lens of my question. Um, so one of the things that we talked about is the concept of um, how do you explain these concepts, which there there's a lot of terms, there's a lot of jargon, um, there's a lot of uh, acronyms built into the multiple kind of uh, complex systems that are a part of the IAD, the GKC, the SES frameworks, right? And so we, uh, for me, as, as, a, as an anthropologist coming into this field, it was a lot and I had a hard time kind of conceptualizing it. Um, and so something that we talked about, um, which I think has been a thread throughout this conversation is how do you operationalize these terms to meet the needs of different stakeholders, um, but also um, different forms, levels of action situations. So understanding that different situations, different um, CPR problems are going to have um, differing levels of complexity, um, but that also your stakeholders, whether those are undergraduate students, PhD students who are political scientists, PhD students who are not um, in political science or environmental sciences, um, uh, as Hilda just talked about, folks who are in the um, hard sciences or engineering, um, how do we operationalize these ideas to attend um, to these different audiences um, and, and to be understandable and operationalized. And one of the things that we talked about that's important um, is to recognize um, whether those your, your audience or your stakeholders have an investment um, in what their investment in the framework is. And that's something I'm also hearing in these conversations is what is your stakeholders investment in the framework? Is your stakeholders investment in the workshop? Is it in the ostrums or is it in the ways in which they can use this framework to attend to the problems in their work or to help them to better frame the questions that they should be seeking, kind of as Mike McGinnis just talked about, the questions that they should be considering in their work. So we tried to, um, uh, set up our, um, our, our PowerPoint as like an example of what our, um, our video would be, um, our webinar would be, and we would love feedback on that, um, but really uh, trying to key into that uh, um, attending to multiple stakeholders. So I'll let Dr. Brondizio go from here. Thank you, Jordan. So uh, as Jordan said, we took a very different approach. We, we took a, a challenge of speaking to a mid-schooler, you know, or to a high schooler, or to someone in a first year course that never heard of the terms or any of the terms. So one of the things that we discuss is how can we use some very concrete examples or simple examples that people can relate to, to understand, you know, the fundamental uh, social problem of a common pool resource, you know, the problem of appropriation and and provisioning and how we depend on each other uh, in governing those resources. So I start with an example that I often use in a variety of ways in my 101 class on uh, sustainability, which is to get students to think about a resource in their house, let's say a jar of cold water in the refrigerator, you know, that represents that dilemma of people appropriating it, you know, and, and thinking about the context and whether people contribute or not to, you know, to, to keep it plenty, uh, you know, as, as, as creating that, that situation that uh, may or may not lead to a, a tragedy. So we try various examples, um, really trying to get to the issue of scale and how the, the complex of the social scale, you know, pose basically the same problems, but a different level of complexity of getting them. So we went to this simple introduction where we get the, the person to think about the resource itself, 
Uh, and then, so the, a question of, of interdependence, and then a question, uh, you know, of the different natures of the problems that may be behind that. So we try to translate, you know, the technical terms of appropriation externality or rent dissipation or assignment problem or, and so forth to things that are very common to people on their daily lives. You know, the, the, the free rider, you know, the faster, fastest users, the, the one that is closer and take advantage of, the one who has used technology to take advantage of things and, and so forth. And, and how the scale of the problem creates more complexity to this different, uh, the nature of, of these different problems. And then uh, think about, uh, you know, what, what are the challenges of governing it, you know, from a small group and the kinds of, of ideas that facilitate governing it among a small group, all the way to challenges that become very complex, the pace of change becomes complex and so forth. So that was our approach to it, you know, sort of to relate to people's lives and to people that are mostly not familiar at all with any uh, of uh, these issues. So that was it. <laughs> Fantastic. And I'm so impressed by your PowerPoint skills alone. <laughs> but no, thank you. Thank Jordan. you so much. <laughs> Edwin, Jordan, brilliant. Um, any, any, any questions, any comments for uh, either Edu or Jordan? I love where this is headed. I think, I think it's just fantastic. I, I have a quick comment. Um, please, please, Brett, yeah. So mm -hmm. I love that idea. It, it, it relates to something not knowledge commonsy, but my re-engineering humanity, like another thing I do on tech and humanity, I've been thinking a lot about how to write like an, a tech ethics or a tech reader or, or something to reach mm -hmm. like middle school, high school, and, you know, and, and the parents of middle schoolers and high schoolers. Um, and so I don't know, like it, you just maybe think they should do the same thing for the knowledge common stuff too. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, I just want to applaud you for thinking about it that way. Um, and I don't know if anyone else is thinking like if that's what this is at all about, but the idea of developing resources that can then be used in, you know, school settings like high schools and middle schools, I think is a great, it's a great idea. And I just hadn't really mm -hmm. thought about it. So, you know, I'd love to hear more, like we could talk you know, offline or something about just it. Feel like clarify so we didn't completely come out of this comment or this idea by ourselves so there's actually this really interesting wired series um, on youtube where they uh, explain things to multiple audiences so they have somebody who's like an ai scientist explain their work to a child um, a teenager a college student a grad student and then one of their peers and so it really uh we had that discussion with each other how would we distill this information if we were a part of that series to those different levels and that's how we came up dude, with it dude let's do that series <laughs> <laughs> no i mean right like it'll take some work but that's yeah. a great idea thanks jordan i'm gonna look that up yeah no jordan if you have a link please do share because that, yeah that, I, i've cool. got to do some searching around but oh no worries no worries yeah we're, we're happy to send it out afterward too but I, I, lo I love that i love that to be able to pitch this at different levels and no that's certainly the goal is not just to have this for universities of course um, you know, all the way up, right? K through 12 would be fantastic. Um, that's one reason that we've been working on the Lens on Common Life book, right? To help help really get at, you know, school age kids and their parents too. Um, any other uh, thoughts, questions, reflection uh, for Jordan and Edu? Uh, Scott, could I make a oh, Please, Mike. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yep. Yeah. Um, I want to reach back to something Lynn, Lynn once wrote in a, in, a, in a couple papers on her work on um, civic education. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, you know, civic education is usually thought of, at least by political scientists, in terms of teaching kids, you know, how the Constitution works or how the, and she said what we needed to do, rather, was to help students at all levels of learning understand the problem of collective action and, and, and how, how we can do better jobs at collective action, and I always found that very striking, that that's not what people normally talk about in terms of civic education. But she really argued that was the most critical kind of knowledge that people need, even, you know, uh, maybe even more than technical literacy or something, uh, just to be able to, to, to understand the problems of how people, how they work out. Cause, and you can draw from their own experiences on that. But I just, I was, I was struck by how much that resonated with what Edu and, and Jordan and, and Brett were just talking about. 
uh, uh, that that we really need to be able to communicate to these different audiences, and that's a whole other level of challenges. So, you know, polycentric governance for kindergartners. I got to work on that one for a while. <laughs> I would love to read that to my kids, Mike. <laughs> Especially if you could rhyme it, uh, that'd be ideal. <laughs> But no, it's such a good point. And you just on NPR this morning, there was a whole piece on, you know, civics education. And, and I, I could easily see, you know, some of this content fitting in really well. And I, I would have to think there would even be some uh, partnership opportunities with the School of Ed and some grant opportunities to distill some of this down for, you know, various, uh, you know, civics uh, classes. So we can certainly explore that. Well, look, in today's, yeah. in today's world of misinformation, all, all, all reality and common nonsense and misinformation, it's all the more relevant for everyday people at all levels to sort of on exactly the civic. It's just a great, just a great point on this, connecting it to civics education. Sorry to, to jump in, but thanks. Yeah, I, you get me excited. Oh, don't worry. <laughs> I was just going to add too that I I love this idea of civics education and getting the kind of core ideas out to a much wider audience. Um, I also think what Jordan and I do presented is super useful for undergraduates. You know, at, because it's so distilled, it's so succinct, it sets up right away a series of comparisons and it really reinforces that or, or introduces even that idea of scale. Um, and so for students to be able to kind of get that initially and then dig into the greater complexity, I think is really, um, really excellent, would be very useful. Uh, yeah, I, I do use this in my 101 class, uh, and it's interesting. I mean, I, I, of course, they have to read Hardin, then they read someone 10 years later, like Bonnie McKay, and then, you know, Lean, uh, a later paper by Lean, Tom Dietz, uh, really summarize it. Mm -hmm. But then, instead of working with Hardin's example itself, I try to bring it to something that they relate, you know, in their daily mm -hmm. lives where they live and so forth. So it, it works well. I, sometimes I use a, a keg of beer, you know, sometimes a, a pot of pot or something <laughs> that they relate that, you know, is exhaustible and depends on people coordinating things. So it can be very, very effective. Um, I do before we close on, a, on, a, on the previous subject, the IAD, uh, 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 to make a comment, which is sort of on the other side of the comment that Brett's made, you know, about teaching uh, to a more technical kind of audience, is teaching to a very humanistic, you know, audience uh, or to a, a very cultural anthropology audience, which poses a lot of other challenges. And, you know, Mike, Ben and I had some actually fun with that some time ago. And the challenge is the following. There's a, there's a semiotic to the IAD that immediately provokes people's emotions about how you're representing a social situation. And that semiotic is both the box aspect of it and the mechanistic aspect of it. So right away, you know, some people be turned off immediately because they see of it as an over-reductionist thing. Or on the other hand, if you just explain, you know, well, people are interacting, under context, producing result, whatever way you explain a simple way, so, well, I know that, you know, so it either dismisses because it's too obvious or, you know, really reject it because it's over mechanistic and, you know, boxes. So we played once with not using boxes, but using clouds, you know, using star, oh, yeah. using <laughs> <laughs> as a way of, of trying to reach that, that group. So I want to share that because it, it, we do need to think about that, that, you know, it conveys a particular, a particular impression and emotion. Yeah. That's wonderful, Edu. Th thank you so much. Um, and, and indeed, Thank, thank you all. So please join me in, well, and thanking everyone, all of the, all of the workshoppers, all of the fellows. Wonderful, wonderful work. Um, as you see, it's coming along very nicely. Uh, and I, I'm really excited about the direction we're heading. And I'm happy to, to say again that Harini in particular is going to be able to help. And we'll say more about that in a few weeks with continuing to push this ball forward um, in the coming months too. Um, so thank you again for sticking with. 
Um, I just really enjoyed this. <laughs> so th thank you all again for all the hard work that went into it. Um, we'll be in touch. And again, if you have suggestions, if you have thoughts, ideas about how to make this that much more useful at a number of levels, um, let us know. And on the way out, here we go. Um, happy to report that Lens Uncommon Life is officially coming out uh, from uh -huh. IU Press later this year. Uh, so we just we just submitted the final version just a couple weeks ago. So Emily did so much heavy lifting. Uh, Hannah Dickens, fantastic um, illustrator, and it's I think it turned out actually pretty well. Um, so it's that's going to be fun. So we'll make sure as soon as it's ready, let us know. Uh, reserve your copy, and we'll make sure to get that uh, get that to you as well. Um, so thanks again, everybody, for joining. Have a wonderful rest of the afternoon, evening, morning. Thanks, guys. <laughs> thanks, guys. Thanks. Bye, Bye everyone.